I want to think with you tonight out of the book of Luke, and I want to look at Luke, and we'll move to the sixth chapter tonight. We were in the fifth chapter on Sunday. We'll move to the sixth chapter tonight, and I just want to take the first few verses, and I just want to share with you some thoughts about who Jesus is and and, uh, how He affects our life. And I hope Jesus is touching your life in dramatic fashion and, and going through you to touch the lives of other people. As I think with you tonight in uh, the Gospel according to Luke, uh, I want to just keep Jesus as the focus, okay? Jesus is the focus, and just see Jesus. Look at the picture just a second of Jesus. Now, this is just a, an artist concept of what Jesus looked like. We don't really know. And uh, we only have our imagination to take and, and go back from, uh, from the shroud that was over his face, the, the blood marks and things like that, and different things to, to imagine what Jesus looked like. And this is just a, an artist's representation of what he looked like. But one thing he was was he was a man that, that was looked at by the community and they knew who he was. He just had some different ideas. Uh, I guess God would than the community at large. He had some different ideas from the church of his day. And he wanted to revolutionize the church in such a way that the church would come to know his Father God. And that uh, as a result of that, that we might have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to live with us. As we look at the sixth chapter tonight, look with me at the verses following here. And thank you uh, for earlier looking at that. It was a Sabbath day. Sabbath day would have been a Saturday. And uh, we don't worship on the Sabbath anymore. The Sabbath was always the day that God set aside. He created the world and all the different universe and everything else in six days. And on the sixth day, he created man. And then on the seventh day, starting on Sunday, Saturday would be the Sabbath, the last day uh, of the the cycle. And on the seventh day, he took and he rested. And that's where we get the Sabbath day rest. And it was a Sabbath day. And because it was a day of rest, no work was done that day, it was a great day to go to church. It was a day to to worship uh, God and to uh, draw near to Him. And so Jesus used this day to go into the church, into the tabernacle, and He would teach there the people in the community about God and uh, love. But Jesus uh, saw some things here on earth that really needed to be revolutionized, changed in the way that we worship God. You know, some people come to church and go away, and and they have maybe a a great uh, experience in, in that they were emotionally touched, that they may have learned a little bit about it. But God wanted His Son to come here and to give us a first-hand uh, personal relationship with Him. And that's what Jesus was trying to do, is to help us know that we can have a relationship with God. And then, of course, you, you understand that, that today we look back upon something even greater than the creation of the world. How can anything be greater than the creation of the world 6,000 years ago? Well, Jesus, when He came, He lived for 33 years, but only three years did he get out and touch hands with people like you and me. And in those three years, he took and chose 12 men, and he chose them to be the leaders that would lead the church after he went back to heaven. Then after three years, he permitted himself to be crucified. He gave himself up. They crucified him, and he died. He was dead for three days. And then He showed us something that we needed to see, and that is that He is the Lord over everything. went to see a movie uh, yesterday. You'll be able to see it in March. A couple of you went with me to see a preview movie. I get a chance to preview these movies coming out of Hollywood and and give an opinion on what they're going to be like. It was a movie about uh, uh, this uh, man... And I think, what was his name? I've heard him as a singer before. What was his name? Oh, Jeremy Camp. I knew it was something like that. And uh, Jeremy Camp, it's his life story about uh, his relationship with the Lord and uh, how, what God did in his life, the difficulties he went through and, and uh, when he met his first girlfriend, big girlfriend, and they got married and all of that. And uh, the movie would be coming out, and in that movie you see that God is... Uh, having a relationship with God is more than just something you show up for on Wednesday night. Something more than you just show up for on Sunday. It was, it's a relationship that, that you walk with God. And one of the, the, probably the most remarkable thing in the movie for me 
was a time when one of the stars in the movie said, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm totally healed. And then she died. And you think, whoa, I thought totally healed meant that you, you don't die. But she, she come to understand that the most important thing in all of our life is the moment we put our hand in Jesus and we're taken into His presence eternally never to have to suffer anything, cancer or any kind of pain or any kind of surgery like tomorrow or anything like that, that we don't have to ever have a cold again. We'll have to have friends that, that go away or break a heart and, and marriages that break up and, and children that go astray and get into drugs and all those kind of different problems. All those are gone. And I think it's, I put down that it's the best movie that I've seen in years. And uh, the most remarkable thing was about it for me was that scene when she said, I'm healed, I'm healed. And then moments later, he walked into heaven and uh, God said, you got it, babe. <laughs> the problems are over. You're in for the good times now. And she had left a great testimony. And the results of that is that it touched the life of Jeremy Camp in a way that he went on, and you know him today as a great singer and an entertainer, and went on to touch his life in such a way that he has become a great singer and entertainer in the Christian faith. You'll get a chance to see that. It says, I still believe is the name of that movie, and you'll, you'll see it come into the theaters in March of next year. Well, keeping our focus on Jesus tonight, and we're looking here in the sixth chapter, he says in the sixth chapter here that uh, on the Sabbath he passed through the grain fields. And he did something very unusual. We're going to do it this Sunday too. We're going to go over to the grain fields of Olive Garden this Sunday. And we're going to go over there and rub some, some things together and, uh, and have a great meal. No matter what you like, Mexican food, Italian food, they got it all over there. Hamburgers, hot dogs. And uh, just joking, of course. And they're going to take and have a a great meal for us over there, and we'll have a chance to fellowship and get around that. And that's what Jesus' disciples did on a Sunday. They got hungry, and so they went out for a fellowship in a grain field. And uh, the church got upset about it. Got upset. And it's ridiculous, but uh, the church got upset that they went and, and had a meal together on Sunday. And so we'll see tonight what Jesus had to say about that. But we're going to keep Jesus as the focus tonight. And everything we're doing, Jesus is the focus. The first thing that I want to say is that Jesus is the focus of religion. Religion can get way askew. It can go off. Religion does nothing to save people except tell them about Jesus. And if religion is not doing that, then religion is a waste of time. Religion is just usually a set of rules and a rule-making body that takes and lays a load on us that we can't keep up with. And then we'll look at other areas of this. But let's take and think first about Jesus and religion and how it affected Him in His day. As we pray, would you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank You so much for coming. We worship You now on Sunday because more than important and greater than the experience of You creating the world and creating man and placing us here in the first six days. Lord, You rested on the Sabbath day. That was Saturday. still is. But Lord, you did something even more important the next day on Sunday when you raised from the dead. Just like in the movie, I still believe she discovered something tremendously important. And that's why we celebrate you and worship you on Sunday. It's because she discovered that you're not dead. You're still alive. And that even though we may die physically here, we live eternally a great and convenient life just like we have here except without the pain, without the problems. We continue to live and enjoy the blessings of world as You created it. Thank You, Lord. Bless us tonight as we uh, stop and take a moment and reflect upon You being the focus in our life and in our world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Jesus is above religion. Isn't that nice to know? Religion's been some of the, the, the hardest moments of my life is religion. And uh, that, isn't that ridiculous that a pastor would say that? Religion has done more to hold me down than it ever has to lift me up. But Jesus is what I worship. 
Jesus is the one that I worship, and He's the one that pulls me up and takes me above any kind of rules and regulations and all those kind of things that you have to go through. Uh, religion said that in his day, religion said that it was all right if uh, people were traveling, if they would stop off and see a field over here where somebody was growing uh, different crops, that they would go into the field and they would glean, get a couple of ears of corn or something like that, and that they would take and, and eat that for nourishment as they were traveling along. Now, of course, they weren't to go in there and steal the crops, but they could go in there and just get some to eat and things like that. And that that was legal. But religion came along and took and added to the burden of people. And it said, well, it's okay if you eat. It's okay if you grab one for yourself and get a bite to eat. But do not cook it and do not prepare it and do not take and, and, uh, take and rub it. And, and rub the husk off. You ever tried to eat corn before you took the husk off of it? Is that good or not? No? Well, religion's always out there to mess your life up. It really is. And it, it's got so many different rules and regulations. In other words, what they really were saying is that you can't eat on Sunday. Uh, you can't do this. You can't do that. It's a bunch of rules and regulations. And uh, you, you see that religion sometimes can cause problems, and it did for Jesus too it would eventually lead to, in three years, just three years, him being crucified. Religion said it was legal to pluck the grain from a neighbor's field, and you could eat it, but you could not take and use a sickle to get it. That means you could not take and, and get something to help you get it out. Uh, my wife, when she was young, she used to be part of going out and harvesting crops. And, and she talks about, and I don't understand it, that they would go out there, was it corn? that you'd cut the tops off of. And the first thing you had to do is reach way up there and cut the tops off of it like that. Then cut, later you come back and get the rest of it or something like that. And then she, I think one of her favorite memories that she talks about every time we go past a cotton field, she gets so excited talking about how she used to harvest cotton. Hard work, I'm sure, but uh, great memories in her past as she was growing up and uh, was out there harvesting crops as a migrant worker. But, you know... They said you couldn't use anything to get any help with. How would you like to cut those tops off with your, uh, just use your teeth to clip them off up, you know, gnaw it off or, or, or cut it with your fingernails or something like that. They said you couldn't do anything like that. The whole purpose what religion was doing is to make things difficult for you and, and for me. And religion's still doing it. Still doing it today. And uh, we read in Deuteronomy 23, about that. Follow me along here. It says, When you enter into a neighbor standing grain, you may pluck the heads of grain with your hand, but do not put your sickle on your neighbor's grain. Don't use any instruments. Don't use your knife to help you with this thing. Don't even rub the shucks off. You just got to eat it like it is. In other words, you're not going to eat it, period. And Jesus uh, took His disciples. They were hungry. They, they were doing ministry. And they came along to field. They got some. And the result is that they got criticized for it. Look at uh, Luke 6 here, verse 1 again. And it continues in Luke 6, verse 1. And it says, On the Sabbath he passed the grain fields. His disciples picked the heads of grain. He rubbed them with their hands and they ate them. Verse 2. But some of the Pharisees said, What are you doing? Don't you know that's unlawful on the Sabbath day? This is the day of rest. You're not supposed to be working, fixing your food. And Jesus answered them and said, Haven't you read what David and those men who were with him did when he was hungry? And how he entered into the house of God and went up to the holy of holy place. He took and he ate the bread for the presence. That was a bread right up in the holy presence, which is not lawful for anybody to eat but the priests who were serving there on duty. And he even gave some of those who were with him uh, some of the food too. And Jesus went on to say, The Son of Man is the Lord of every day. He's the Lord of Sabbath. He's the Lord of Friday. He's the Lord of Wednesday. He's the Lord of Sunday. He's the Lord of every day. And it continues there in the passage that Jesus is the Lord of the whole thing. And that's what we ought to remember too. The Son of Man is the Lord of even our worship day. It's His day, and He can do what He wants to do. The Lord's offense was simple. He was the Lord of the Sabbath, 
and he's king, and he's not restricted by any of man's rules. Man's rules. Uh, his example was taken from David back in the thing, and it angered the people when he did this. Jesus was again claiming to be somebody. Look at 1 Samuel 21. 1 Samuel 21, David went to the priest Ahimelech at Nob, and Ahimelech was afraid to meet David, so he said to him, Why are you alone? Why are you alone and no one is with you? And David answered the priest Ahimelech, The king gave me a mission, but he told me, Don't let anyone know that anything about the mission that I'm sending you on or what I've ordered you to do. I have stationed my young men at a certain place. He was protecting them. And what have you on your hands? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest told him, There's no ordinary bread on hand. However, there is consecrated bread, but the young men may eat it if they only have kept themselves from women. And David goes on to say, Well, that's not a problem. I swear that the women are, the, men, the women are being kept from us as always when we go out to battle. The young men's bodies are consecrated even on an ordinary mission so that, of course, their bodies are consecrated today. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, for there was no bread there except for the bread of the presence right there off of the Holy of Holies that had been removed from the presence of the Lord. When the bread was removed, it had been replaced with fresh bread, with warm bread. And one of Saul's servants... They came before the Lord that, there that day. And his name was Dog, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. And David said to him, like, Do you have a spear or sword on hand? I didn't even bring my sword or my weapon since the king's mission was so urgent, he went on to say. And the priest, re- the priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the epilogue. Ephlod, if you want to take it for yourself, then take it. There isn't another one here. Then none like it. And David said, well, give it to me then. We see that as he goes back and he looks back at these times in the past, he said David was allowed to do that and he became the king and was so honored by you and is revered by you even today. And I can certainly do that. I am the son of David. Jesus claims to be the very son in the lineage of David. And, of course, the son of uh, God would come through the son of David. He was actually claiming to be the Messiah, which they had been waiting for. Now, they never accepted him as the Messiah. They killed him because he claimed to be the Messiah. The Messiah is God who would come from heaven to earth and save man. After 400 years of not speaking to man through the Bible or anything, the priest could not get a word from God, and the people were starved to hear from God. Jesus came and said, I am the Son of David. That's another name for I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. I am the Messiah Himself, Christ, who the people had been waiting to see. And look at Matthew 11 uh, added to this. Jesus is above religion. Come on now, all of you who were weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Jesus said, if you want to get rest, come to me. Take up my yoke and learn from me. Notice that to get rest, we pick up work. Isn't that interesting? When we want to get rest, when we want to get refreshed, when we want to come out of the, the humdrum of today, we're to take and come to church. We're to take and get down with our Bible and get on our knees and go to the Lord and take up His yoke and learn from Him. That's how we go to the Word of God, to learn from Him. And learn as lowly and homely, uh, humble in His heart, and you'll find rest for your soul when you do this. My yoke, He says, my work is easy. Easy. My burden is light. He goes on to say that it is something that we ought to treasure and want to do. Jesus is above religion. When we step out of religion and step into Christ, into Christianity, we get above the, wor- the problems of this world and we get the rest that we need. But second, He not only is above religion, but Jesus is all the source. He's the source of everything good. Now, I made a little list here and has all kinds of different things about Jesus, who He is and what He is to you. But basically, He is I Am. In other words, whatever you need, He is the one. He is I Am. I Am the one that will do that for you. 
Jesus is the very source of everything that's good in life. You want something better than what you're going through? You want a circumstance to improvement? Come to Jesus. He is the very source of the good. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees, that is representative of the church. That is representative of religion. That is representative of those people who would tell you what you've got to do. They're representative of the rules and regulations laid down by religion that you must keep. You notice that when they're giving you the rules and regulations, and there are churches that actually teach, major religions that actually teach the rules and regulations, you have to go through their class, their catechism classes, and learn all the rules and regulations and pass the test in that before you can even get in, before you can even be part of one of them. And the church, represented here by the scribes and the Pharisees, they're the ones that know the Bible the best, but rarely use the Bible because they have their own set of rules that they've come up with that are necessary for you to have because they know the truth, so they'll tell you what you need to know rather than teaching you the Word of God so that you can read it for yourself and listen to God rather than listening to them. Isn't it amazing how many people show up for religious teaching, but so few turn up to worship Jesus Christ who gives to us freely? The scribes and the Pharisees attended the religious service But they didn't attend to worship God. They came there for a purpose, and that is because Jesus was taking away the people, was changing their heart from from them and their rules and regulations and their collection of money, was taking them away from that and guiding them toward, uh, taking them away from guiding them toward Jesus Christ. Jesus is God in the very flesh. They knew that Jesus would be there and that Jesus probably would have the man that over in chapter 5 that uh, he was paralyzed and the men took and led him down through the roof and healed him and he was able to get up and walk out and have a full life again. They knew that he'd probably be there listening to Jesus too. And so they didn't want to, to have Jesus having any success there that day. So they came to create problems to take and, and mess with the church service, if you please. Jesus defended this man and defended his value. Any Jew that will will take any Jew in that day according to the to religion could take and rescue a dog or a cat but they couldn't rescue a human being see the problem was not that Jesus healed the man the problem was that Jesus healed the man on the sabbath and it was against the rules even to eat uh, on sabbath day unless you just pick it up and eat it like it was and it was also wrong to help somebody somebody that was sick if they had needed an aspirin you couldn't give them an aspirin uh, they were not to do those kind of things on that day. It was a Sabbath day. You were to take and refrain and suffer through life on that day. Look at Matthew 12, verse 11 with me for just a moment. And Jesus replied to them and says, Who among you, if they had a sheep that fell into a pit, now you could rescue an animal. You could, you could care for an animal. You could feed an animal. You could work for an animal. We live in a world today that cares more about animals than they do human beings. And who among you, if I had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, would take hold of that animal and lift it out? Jesus says. And then, is a person worth far more than a sheep? So is it lawful to do what is good on Sabbath? If a person needs some help on the Sabbath day, the day of rest, of course you forget the rules and regulations. You help that person. And uh, that's a, an important thing. So, but that's not the way the Jews taught in that day, when tra- or even today. When traditions become more important than people, there is a problem because God took and made people the focus of this world, not traditions. When traditions, rules and regulations, when religion becomes more important than people, the traditions must be examined and they must be changed. There's a problem there. As a result of the miracle, Jesus would be hated even more. And so they came to this service that he was teaching in on the Sabbath day because they figured that he would be creating more of these type things. And they wanted to, they even joined in with Herodians. The scribes and the Pharisees, they barely got along, but they hated another religious group called the Herodians. And so they even got together with them. It'd be kind of like today, uh, the Christian church being accosted by the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, and they all gather together and they take and they hate 
the Christian church so much that they come against it. And, and in fact, that is true. Even churches that so disagree with each other, that put each other down, that they would come together, the religions would come together and cast down Jesus Christ in His church today. But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus realized that He had a purpose in being here, and His purpose in being here would be to pay for my sins so that when I die, I could come to heaven. Not because I'd lived a religious good life, but because I knew who Jesus was and had put my trust in Him for eternal life and for life itself today. That's one of the things that I can believe, I still believe the movie, is this girl had a tremendous, tremendous, powerful belief in who Jesus Christ was and what He could do for her. She just tremendously believed in Him. And you'll see in that uh, all the different uh, praying and, and conviction and the belief that, that Jesus is going to do something for her. And you, you, you go through the movie and you just know everything's going to work out great. You, you expect tremendous miracles to happen. And they do happen, but not in the way that we expect. Jesus chose the leadership that He would put in charge of the church. You know who He chose? People like me. He chose people <laughs> who couldn't do anything else. He just chose the weak and the, and the inferior. And He chose those people that would be dedicated to Him and would learn about Him and walk with Him. He chose people like that to be His twelve disciples. I want you to understand something. He even chose you. You. You say, what? there's no way in the world He'd choose me. I know myself all too well to know He wouldn't choose me. He did. He chose you. He chose you. You know why He chose you? Because you can do nothing except through Christ. And that's what He wants is to receive the glory through your life. He chose you. You see, Jesus chooses His own leadership. He chooses people that could never get it done on their own. He chooses people that are weak and, and full of error so that He can take and shine through them and people will not look at them, but they'll look at Him. Jesus is the one who wants to be praised. Once again, Luke talks about the enemies of Jesus in this passage. Look with me at verse 6. At verse 6, please, first. And uh, in Luke uh, 5, uh, verse uh, chapter 6, verse 6, On another Sabbath day he entered the synagogue, he was teaching, and a man who was there, his right hand was shriveled. And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him close. They said, he's going to heal him, he's going to heal him, and looked to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so they could put another charge against him. But they, he knew their thoughts. And he told the man with the shriveled hand, Get up. So he got up and he stood there. And as he looked at this man, Jesus said to him, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to save a life or to destroy a life? Religion said, let him die on that day. He has to wait for tomorrow. After looking around at all of them, he told him, he said, now stretch out your hand. And he did. And his hand was restored. What did he do? What did he do? I'll tell you what the man did. He believed Jesus and did what Jesus said to do. And that's what it takes for you to receive eternal life and the joy and the healing that comes with that. They, however, were filled with rage and they started discussing with one another what they might do. Verse 12, please. And so during those days, he went to the mountain to pray, and he spent all night. Jesus had been fighting with his knuckleheads, and he was at the point uh, of saying, God, what do I do, Father? What is the next step that I do? It seems like I'm being opposed on every single hand. You know, I, I run into Christians all the time that say, Pastor, I've tried my best. I've, I'm doing the best I can. You just don't do just have no clue the circumstances that I have to live in as if I don't have circumstances either. And so they say, I just can't do anything for Jesus. It just seems like I, I'm beating my head up a wall, against a brick wall. There's nothing I can do. Jesus 
could have felt that way too. But instead, he went and he got on his knees and he said, Father, here's where I am right now. And that's what you and I need to do too. And when the daylight came, he summoned his disciples after praying all night and he chose 12 of them. You know what God's solution was for Jesus? Father, I've only got three years before I'm coming back to heaven. I'm not making any headway down here. I can't get my kids. I can't get my grandchildren. I can't get my husband. I can't get my wife to turn around and come to Jesus. Jesus said, Father, what do I do? You know what the Father said? Get some of those weak men to help you. And I tell you what, Jesus, three years, you're going to turn it all over to them. And I'm sure Jesus in his, in his human mind would have thought something like, this is the plan? <laughs> We're going to trust these people to win the world? They're fishermen. You don't understand the problem I have corralling these 12 guys. Jesus said, we're going to put it totally in their hand, and they're going to start a movement that in 2019, of October, it will still be going on, and millions of people will come into the kingdom of God because of these 12 men. You'll be choosing them. So in the morning, they got up. Simon, who also he named Peter and his brother. Go back to verse 13 there just a second. When the daylight came, he summoned the disciples and he said, I talked to God last night. He told me that you guys are going to be the ones that are going to carry on. I get to go to, to, to heaven and be at rest. And I can just see the twelve thinking, Ah, uh, this is the plan? And he chose twelve of them who he also named to be apostles. Apostles. Now, a disciple is everybody that is learning to be an apostle, if you please. They were disciples, but God chose them to be apostles as they would go out and teach others and lead them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Every disciple has that responsibility. But the apostles were to do more. They were to take and literally start the church of Jesus Christ here on this world and get it going. And we're left behind to continue that in the vein of what the apostles began. We have the Word of God that they delivered to us. We're to use what the apostles took and from God Himself spoke through them and they wrote it down. We're to use it. It's called the New Testament. And it shows us how God is taken and He's over religion, which has never been God's plan, it was to show us that we're sinners and fail and we're to take and take the New Testament and it's to be our vehicle for leading people to know Jesus Christ. What a plan. What a plan. And God chose the weakest, the most frail, and the most likely to fail people to be His vehicle through which He would win the world to Jesus Christ. He chose me and you. Will we be vehicle through which He wins the world, wins the world and takes them to heaven? The most important decision that had to be made, His enemies were after Him. It was necessary that He pray. This was a good example for you and I to follow when we feel like it's all on us and we're not going to make it, is it to follow in our ministries too the example that Jesus did, and that is to get out and to pray and pray and pray until God gives the answer. And don't let up until God gives the answer. That's what God wants you to do. And that's what God expects to do. That is the only plan that God has for winning the world today. It's not... Preachers like me. It's people like you and me that God wants to use to win this world to Jesus Christ. My job, my calling is to teach you the Bible. I was to go and spend 
time learning the Word of God so that I could come and teach it to people who could not go and learn the Bible to get you a jump start so you could begin to use the Word of God that you understand to win the world to Jesus Christ. And I'm to do the same thing. That's a responsibility. Will we do it? You see, if Jesus is the focus, we won't depend upon religion to do it. Religion will only cast people into hell and make their lives miserable and turn people against God. It's to be your life and my life lived out in front of people where they see Jesus in you and me. And it begins with making a commitment. What's the most important thing that you learned tonight in this message? Well, I hope you learned this one thing, and that is that it all depends upon you and me. Where do we begin? We take what we know, pray, 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 and then get up and do it even though it doesn't make any sense because that's what God will use to change your family, your neighbors, and this whole world that we're living in today. Is your life committed to Jesus Christ? How do you do that? Well, it begins by first acknowledging that it's true. Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe that that my whole life depends upon what you've taught me, and I believe it, and I'm going to live it. And that begins with a public declaration. That's what baptism is, is a public declaration that you believe that if you don't take and trust Jesus Christ, you'll wind up in hell itself. But by trusting Jesus Christ and committing your life to Him and doing it His way, you not only will go to heaven, but you'll take with you a host of people. Not it through your example. Our examples are terrible but through your sharing Jesus Christ with other people. The fact, don't look at my life. Look at the life that I'm following Jesus Christ. He's the one that will get us both to heaven. And then following Jesus not only in public declaration of it, but also in believer's baptism. And then that's when we come together in the second ordinance of the church, the second thing that we do that God ordained that we would do, and that is we gather around the table and we fellowship together. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. It's to teach us that fellowship with other believers will help us to grow strength together. That's the reason that we go to Subway. That's the reason we go to Olive Garden, all the different places that we get together and eat. That's the reason we go to one another's house and have a meal together and go out to the movie or or to a restaurant together. We do that so that we learn that we are God's tool to change in our families and our neighborhoods, even our nation, back to Jesus Christ. There's a purpose in it, and that's so that not just you will get into heaven. How tragic would it be if you die and go to heaven and God says, come on in. Who's coming after you? And you say, oh, I don't know. I guess all those that do what I did. Well, Jesus said, yeah, but who are they? You say, how would I know? That's up to them. Jesus is not in. It's up to you. How tragic. Stand before God and to tell Him, I did nothing with the blessing that you gave me. Begin tonight making your commitment to Jesus. Begin tonight by being public about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Begin tonight by going in fellowship with other believers that believe that way. And beginning to talk to your neighbors and friends, bringing them into the church of Jesus. Would you stand together with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for such a simple gospel that even I can understand it. It's one that we certainly can share with somebody else. We don't have to have special training to be able to appreciate what Jesus has done for us and to obey Him and follow Him and then tell other people that's all we did. We just followed Jesus. And we're dependent upon Him. Speak to hearts tonight, Lord, that they would make that commitment. May this be the most important thing that they got out of the message tonight is that we're to take do what Jesus did. Pray and then get up and do it. In Jesus' name.